Bonjour à tous. Okay, uh, off we go. So good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for being present with us today for this conference within the scope of Bio360. I'm delighted to be in charge of leading this session. The session has been prepared by the organization team of Bio360, along with the association L and Biogas Valley. My name is Grégory Lanou. I'm going to lead this session, and I'm the person who will be conveying all of your questions to our speakers. So, what we're going to be talking about here today is externalities in a conference entitled How to Maximize the Environmental Benefits of Anaerobic Digestion. So, we're going to pass the floor now over to Sylvain Frédéric, who is in charge of biomethane projects. Next, we will have um, Armel Damigno. And let me just stress, first of all, that Sylvain is in charge of um, R&D for biomethane at GRDF, and he also focuses on the Strategic Committee for Greenhouse Effect Gases. He's a member of this committee. I'm sure you've heard about this, and he would speak more about this in detail. We have François Trubert, who is gracing us with his presence. He's a methanizer and a, fa and a farmer within the Association of Methanizer Farmers, and he does a lot of work on the return to the earth of the uh, products that the methanizers produce. For each of the subjects, our different speakers will give their impression as operators on the different subjects that are to be broached. After that, we'll focus on water quality with Armel Damiano. She is director of the local association for energies and the environment. She works for the L Association. And then we'll have war quality presented by Romain Giraud, who is a farming and environmental engineer. He works for the UR Opal at the INRE the French organization. And then last but not least, we will have a presentation from Safia Menasseri, who is a lecturer and researcher who will talk about the quality of the soils. And she works for AgroCompass West. So each speaker will have their time frame. And then after that, we'll have 20 minutes for question and answers. Do feel free to put any questions to me in the chat, in the discussion. I will take your questions on board and then um, relay them to the different speakers. In front of the Zoom screen, you have um, the possibility of putting your questions in writing on the discussion or the chat function. No doubt I will have to pick and choose. I might not be able to ask all the questions, but during the 20 minute, 20 minute question and answer session, do feel free to put your questions and I'm sure the speakers will be delighted to answer them. And if I'm not able to put all of the questions during the live session, hopefully they'll be able to answer them further down the line. So do come up with as many questions as you have, and I'll do my best to pass them on. So I suggest that we get the session going through the introductory presentation from Cécile Frédéric from France Gas Renewables. So Cécile, over to you. Yes, good morning, everybody. Let me share my screen. Que vous voyez Are you able to see my screen? Mon écran. Excusez-moi, j'ai un petit problème de. I just have a slight problem. Uh, Let me just bonjour, refocus. Uh, bonjour à tous. So, good morning, everybody. Within the scope of this conference, I'm going to be talking to you about the approach that we've entered into within the scope of the strategic contract for our sector when it comes to positive externalities for methanization. The externality action is part and parcel of the work that we're doing within the strategic contract for our sector. This is a contract that has been signed between the state and all of the different sectors that uh, work in new energy systems. And this means that for the methanization sector, it groups together all of the methanization working groups and they aim to make methanization more competitive and to make it competitive by 2030 whilst guaranteeing that it is a sector that creates value for industry in France. The methanization working group that groups together all of the sector revolves around a certain number of subgroups, subworking groups that you can see on the screen. Each of these subgroups aim to work, for example, on reducing production costs, on facilitating the funding of 
of the projects, on the regulatory work and on the clarification, also on the possibilities of speeding up the deployment of the projects whilst enhancing the acceptability. This is a subject that is currently very important for our sector. Next, we also work on research programs. And last but not least, we work upon what we call the implementation of assessment methods for positive externalities. France Guys Renouvelable that I represent today um, is managing this along with the association of methanizer farmers in France. Sorry, I've jumped a bit too far. So the, the work that we're doing in terms of externalities uh, is done at two different levels. First of all, we want to set out a list of all of the positive externalities, and then we want to highlight the different services that we can provide thanks to this sector. Because above and beyond the production of gas, methanization, as you know, provides numerous services to people who work outside of our sector. However, this value is not necessarily always clearly perceived and fully understood and evaluated. This is why we felt it was important to analyze it. So our externality act is to enhance the awareness that people have in terms of the quantification and the monetization of our sector. And what we also want to do is provide food for thought for the value of gas produced through methanization. And on a more long-term basis, we want, to, we hope to drum up more support for the sector. So the work takes place in two phases. The first phase has taken place and gave rise to the mapping out of all of the externalities. We've listed them in order to be able to define and evaluate the externalities. Then after that, further down the line, this is what enables the steering committee to set out the main focuses that will be presented to you um, in this presentation. So at the level of this initial phase, as I said earlier, our basic objective was to identify all of the different positive externalities, all the negative externalities, and also to evaluate the current know-how or the expertise for each of them. We worked based on interviews that we carried out with actors of, of the sector, but we also carried out a bibliography bibliographic study taken in a certain number of studies that, that have been carried out in France. This enabled us to categorize the different externalities. We were able to make a list and there were three themes that came to the fore. And these three themes then enabled us to analyze the contribution made by each of the different parts of the value chain for methanization, taking into account farming systems, environmental externalities, and social and economic externalities. So the energy externalities were cast to the sidelines for the moment, because we consider today that they are covered by the biomethane purchasing agreement that is supported by the state. So as a result, this brought us on to 12 external this gave us 12 externalities that you can currently see on the screen i'm not going to go into detail on each of these externalities but you can see basically that the analysis did enable us to come up with a full list quite a complex list of externalities that illustrates all of the different services that are provided by methanization Following on from this initial piece of work, the steering committee brought together a certain number of actors from our sector, and they decided to work on four themes. They decided that these were to be the priority themes, partly because we only have a certain amount of resources available, but also because other externalities form the subject of other studies and assessments within the scope of uh, other work packages. So when it comes to the externality working group, we decided to work specifically on the resilience of the farms, the capacity that the different farming units have to resist different uh, shocks, whether they're environmental or otherwise. We also decided to work specifically on the question of waste treatment and waste processing and the impact that methanization can have on the workload for this, notably within the scope of the introduction of the obligation for local authorities, for example, between now and 2023 to sort through all of their bio waste sources. Next, when it comes to the outlook and the environmental impact, we decided that 
it was important to work on the quality of the water. Um, the initial results will be presented by Armel Damiano from the A. AIL Association. We looked at the impact of methanization as well on greenhouse effect gases, because this, of course, is a vital subject for our sector. And this is something that Sylvain Frédéric from GRDF will present. So by way of conclusion, the initial analysis that our working group has been able to perform leads to certain conclusions. Methanization is a complex sector, notably in re relation to other examples that we have for producing energy. Um, and methanization clearly enters into a logical process whereby we're looking to achieve circular economy. It's at the crossroads of several words, worlds, whether it's energy, farming or waste. This justifies or explains why it's a complex sector. The externalities of our specific sector, there's many of them. We think most of them are positive. We also note that they cover a variety of different themes and they involve a high number of actors. More generally speaking, from our perspective, methanization is an important form of leverage for developing farming and agriculture in the ecological framework. And we believe that it will make it possible to have dynamic div development transitioning towards a more ecological approach in the whole of the region. Last but not least, as you've been able to see, given the complexity of the subject, for the moment, quantification and hence the monetization of these externalities is a difficult exercise to perform. This, of course, is mainly due to the complexity of the different subjects, sub subjects and systems under study, and also given the variety of projects that we've seen in our local area. Thank you very much for listening. I will happily take any questions that you have further down the line. Thank you very much for your introductory presentation based on all of the work that has been performed within the scope um, of the strategic committee for your sector. Just a few questions that we already have, and I'll pass them on um, when we get to the question and answer session. So without further ado, I suggest that we now move on to the next theme, which is uh, GG's greenhouse effect gases. So Sylvain Frédéric from GRDF is going to talk about this and he's in charge of uh, a working group that focuses on this subject and he's going to talk about quantification and valorization reducing greenhouse effect gases in relation to biomethane. So Sylvain, I'm going to launch your presentation. Okay, I hope everybody's able to hear me. Thank you very much, Grégory. Perfect. So, as has been said, my name is Sylvain Frédéric, and I'm in charge of R&D on biomethane for GRDF. And I also am the co-pilot of the working group for greenhouse effect gases within the CCF. And it's with this cap on that I'm going to present the work that we've carried out over the last 18 months within the scope of the working group. I'm not going to go into detail on the contents on the strategic committee and the work that we do. Um, Cecilia, you did an excellent job on this. I'd just like to stress at this stage that since 2019, since May 2019, we've had a contract, a specific contract that commits all of the methanization sector and the state with regard to a certain number of very tangible targets. Here, what we have to do is search for externalities and to monetize them. So I'm going to explain more specifically what we're doing in the context of greenhouse effect gases and the methods that we're applying. So what we've done is we've put together a working group a greenhouse effect gas working group, and it brings together several types of expert knowledge, expert knowledge on methanization with INRAE, with the AMF, the association that um, works on methanizers with the farmers. Next, we have representatives from the farming world with the agricultural chamber chambers and a whole range of other organizations. And we also have representatives from the methanization sector. They're on the screen, uh, LGR, ATEE, and basically what we wanted was to make sure we had all different types of expertise present so that we could validate our methodology and guarantee that we were able to account for and put a figure to the worth of um, methanization. Just one initial observation I would like to make before we move ahead. 
We'll refer back to this through throughout the presentation. This is why it's important. Methanization, we would argue, at the end of the day involves several functions, several functions that are related to waste processing, producing energy, and also the protection of digestate. This multifunctionality, in fact, makes it possible to reduce greenhouse, greenhouse effect gases at several levels, notably in terms of replacing traditional energies thanks to the use of biomethane. This is true for buildings, and it's also true for mobility in that we can make uh, gas fuels. Next, we can avoid other types of emissions because we use the digestate as an alternative to industrial fertilizer but also we can reduce greenhouse effect gases thanks to uh, the reduction of the offflow from breeding and also we can avoid certain emissions because we can process the waste and we can also store carbon in what we call the intermediate storage areas so why do we want to stress the importance of this multifunctionality well basically because depending on the targets and the objectives that you set for putting a figure on everything for the accountancy we're going to decide whether or not to take this multifunctionality into account and this is why there are different methods next slide so if we use as a starting point this observation on multifunctionality we ought also to focus on the objective of the working group its objective was to recognize and also illustrate the um, deliverables the value of the externalities so the first deliverable was simply to attempt to do better than being simply a link between the different ways of accounting for the reduction of greenhouse effect gases and the set the second deliverable is a method that takes into account all of the different functions and that stresses what their value is. It's all about monetizing these functions, monetizing the functions with a tool. The tool here is the Excel file, and it needs to be able to be adapted on a site-by-site -site basis and not simply to a, different, to a sector, for example, methanization. So in terms of the first deliverable, as I said earlier, at the current time in the methanization sector, there are all different tools and systems that are used to account for the value of um, combating greenhouse effect gases. The first one, of course, is the ADEMS approach. There's another one based on the European Directive RED2. There's another one which is the LCA. And then there's the biomethane uh, study that we've implemented and it could be described as being a low carbon label for methanization. Now the first report that the working group put together is a report that makes it possible to explain all of the targets um, and the differences between the different ways of accounting for the different elements. This is something that gives a clear explanation of the different objectives and the different methodologies. Our idea is to have quite a detailed report, but in particular, a summary that we can easily disseminate to all of the sector, but also to all of the stakeholders so that so that they can understand the different methods and what each of the methods cost or generate in terms of added value. Let me reveal some of the messages that are contained within this report. We've analysed, as I said, the four methodologies, um, the carbon gas uh, life cycle analysis and the methodology for example developed within the the other three projects and what the report basically says is that one the accountancy of greenhouse effect gas emissions is absolutely necessary to fight effectively against climate change it's important to do the accountancy so that you know exactly what each item is costing and to know how we can reduce this cost it's also important to stress that um, doing the accountancy will enable us to know how we can improve certain practices and how we can improve methanization. The second message is that yes, a biomethane today, whatever the method that is used, it is a solution that makes it possible to significantly reduce greenhouse effect gas emissions. And the third message is that it's the main difference between 
well, the main difference between the methods is this multifunctionality. And last but not least, all of these methods very clearly converge towards reducing by reducing at a level of eight to 10 all of the greenhouse gas emissions in relation to standard fuels. Here, what I've revealed is a certain number of graphs that are part and parcel of this report. In green, you can see two methodologies that we've attempted to illustrate in the report. First of all, you have the LCA from 2017, the life cycle analysis from 20, 2017, that gives 23 kilos of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour. Then you've got the second methodology, the low carbon, the ADEM methodology, that gives 44 kilos of CO2 per megawatt hour. If you compare this with the other energies, you've got the geothermal thermal energies, etc. You can see the results and compared with natural gas, then we do benefit. There's the 8 to 10 benefit compared with the 227 kilos of CO2 per kilowatt hour. Now, we haven't presented the RED2 methodology and we haven't presented the LBC methodology. Uh, the low carbon labor method methodology because their methodology applies on a site by site basis. Um, we have a total of four, 44 sites here and we've weighted all of the results based on the different methanization sectors that we've taken into account. The waste treatment plants, the farming sector, the bio waste, whereas the LBC methodology and also the RED2 methodology, they are methodologies that we can apply on a site-by-site -site basis, taking into account each individual entrant, and that will enable us to then provide the information to the project managers. The second deliverable, as I said, is a deliverable concerning the development of a method whereby we can quantify the greenhouse effect, effect gas emissions per site. As I said earlier on, the main accountancy methods for greenhouse effect, effect gases, it, we've, we've talked about the fact that it's the life cycle analysis. This enables us to give a specific figure, uh, 40, 42, 44, um, that is clearly representative of the methanization sector. But these methods do not enable us to perform an assessment at the level of a specific methanization unit. So we wanted to compile an accounting method that could also become a tool, as I said, it's an Excel file for project managers so that at their level, they can provide the accountancy for their project and so that they can account for the specific greenhouse gas emission reductions. What we also wanted to do with this methodology was attempt to optimise and monetize, as I said, um, the reductions in greenhouse effect gases. That's always a pro that's a process that is still underway at the current time. Let's have a look at the tool. This is what it looks like, the Excel file. The project manager basically just has to enter the nature of the entrant, the muck spreading methodology, and potentially the technical options such as recycling of CO2 or sequestration of the CO2. Basically, all the information has to go in so that we can take into account all of the scenarios and obtain a precise figure for the accountancy. So the tool is still currently being tested um, within the scope of the working group. And hopefully by the month of May or at the latest by June, we should have a deliverables and be able to provide this tool with its results. Just a few results that we've already been able to obtain following on from the use and the application of this methodology. Every time we give you a comparison between two specific projects, one, let's say, is a project or a reference scenario. Um, this is the benchmark on the left. And then we have a second scenario, which is a project scenario. And this is where you've got methanization. For the first one, if you look out of the 5,000 tons of entrants, on the left-hand side, we've got 100 um, methanization units. Um, and then we've got the, the natural gas and fertilization. And on the project side, um, we've got the farming unit with the methanization. So we make a clear distinction between the reference scenario and the project-based scenario. And so at the end of the day, as you can see, this gives us the quantification. It quantifies the reduction in greenhouse effect gases. So, so over 35 tonnes of CO2, and hence a result of over a 1,000 tonnes of CO2 avoided. 
today when we look at the situation globally for the sector, these are the kind of results that we come up against. It's the kind of reduction that we tend to see on methanization units generally. So here's my last slide. What is important is how can we, at the end of the day, monetize this reduction in greenhouse effect gases? Well, we want to make our modelization part of the uh, low carbon label. What is it? It's in fact a very innovative system. It's a system that is designed to bring about new projects that aim to reduce greenhouse effect gas emissions. And the label makes it possible to certify the G, G, G emissions and also makes it possible to make them to allocate um, a monetary value to the project. It's, it's a bit like um, a carbon credit for having contributed to reducing greenhouse effect, effect gases. And as a result, these carbon credits potentially could then be sold on the market to a local authority, to an industrialist, or even to a citizen who simply wants to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. And in order to do so, we've got what we call aggregators or cooperatives that potentially could serve as intermediaries between the project managers for methanization projects and these citizens, local authorities or industrialists who would like to reduce their carbon imprint or reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So that's about all I wanted to say, Gregory, uh, at this stage. Thank you very much, Sylvain. Do feel free if you would like to find out more about this subject and if you would like to find out more about the work being done by the Strategic Committee for the sector, you have a LinkedIn page and also a website that you can refer to. I'm making the most of this opportunity now to reach out to Francois Trubert, who's a, who's a farmer and a methanizer. Francois, could you please turn your camera back on? OK, that's perfect. Thank you very much. So, Francois, on your side, I think you have tangible examples, haven't you, where you've been able to note the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions thanks to certain installations, thanks to certain approaches that you adopt. Yes, absolutely. Hello, Francois Trubert. Now, if I go into detail on my own personal experience, for the last 10 years I've been performing methanization. I took part in a programme that was called Metale. Um, it was a programme where we used a cap 2 r tool to measure greenhouse effect gases produced throughout the farm, not just via methanization. And previously, I used to produce CO2. And since the methanization process, I've now switched to a positive energy situation. And I'm able to show a significant drop in the CO2 that is produced. Have you been able to quantify it? It's been quantified by the CAP2R system. It corresponds to a 60 ton drop a 60 ton drop in CO2 equivalent for all of the farm. So in other words, we've gone moved from a situation where we were in the negative to now being in the positive. Um, this corresponds to about 8,000, hang on, let me get this right, 8,000 kilometers for a plane, if you like. This is the example in any case that I like to give. Next, the fact that we've got tools and systems for measuring the results, they, they make us aware of the advantages of methanization. And it's really useful to have these tools because we can measure the impact of what we do. And also maybe we can continue to make additional efforts so that we can further reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Yes, you're absolutely right. Typically speaking, this is the kind of tool and system that farmer farmers can use when they methanize. Yes, all my colleagues from the AMF, from the Association, from the Association for Methanization, um, we're all interested in doing this, in working out how we can implement further reductions at the farm. And well, yeah, what can we do to reduce the amount of carbon produced? Thank you very much, Francois. We'll see you later on following uh, Armel's presentation. So Armel, can you put your camera on, please? So you are in charge of the Association L, and you're going to talk to us about water quality. So would you like to uh, share your presentation? Yes, hello, everybody. So I'm just uh, sharing my screen now. Please tell me if it is properly shared, when it's OK for you. 
So, yes, effectively, I am the spokesperson of uh, some work carried out uh, as part of a collaborative project. So the question raised was the link between methanization and the quality of water and the return to the soil of digested and the quality of water. So the idea behind the working group was to really uh, characterize that link, to look at it in depth. So there was an, uh, no consensus about it uh, at the time when we carried out this work. So the working group was very disciplined from a scientific point of view. It uh, looked at existing scientific expertise. Um, the results were published uh, progressively as we as we made progress. So it was a, a work in progress, let's say. Um, so we wanted to provide a common base on the theme, a base uh, that, of course, will probably be one of the first deliverables of this working group, and it will be published on the uh, CSF website. So the idea was to think about uh, different drivers uh, for uh, optimizing on water quality, but to have a common base of knowledge. So let me explain how we are working on this uh, common knowledge base, how we're going to make it available, for example. So first of all, let me just introduce you to the working group, uh, because we're talking about uh, academic experts, but experts from specialized organizations. So L, I was in charge of the working group. I was the leader, but there were university partners. You can see the different logos. They contributed greatly to the scientific publication. And they also took part in the proofreading and validation of uh, the work. So a summary note was published on the subject. So uh, this is a, a very complete, comprehensive document. It's very exhaustive. So, so it was based on the uh, observation that there was no consensus on the theme at the time. So you can hear positive things, but also things that are not as positive uh, with respect to, to the link between the digested use and the quality of water. So there was no document that allows us to give us to have a summarized vision of the subject. So once again, this is what we heard in the introduction. So there's the greenhouse gas approach, the quality, uh, water quality approach. But here, this is a difference because methanization is part of a system. It's not just uh, on a farm. Sometimes it's it's a whole uh, community that is concerned, and so it induces systemic modifications, deep-reaching modifications. It's not just about substituting fertilizer by uh, with digested. So it, it, a systemic approach was needed. And this approach uh, makes the answer to the question of the link between cause and effect. Uh, it shows that, you know, that that link is not as easy to understand it as all that. So many people uh, collaborated on uh, this document, but there are also specific interviews carried out with specialized organizations. But the discussions, um, there were many discussions, a lot of feedback before the summary note could be drafted. So the summary note is, is uh, very well structured. It uh, reflects a debate consensus. There are sub-themes in the summary note based on the debates that took place. So I'll present it to you in just a little while. Uh, the consensus has, has led to many publications and several times we were able to consider that it was a scientific consensus. So the, the debate well, th th there isn't en enough work yet to really say that we've achieved a consensus, but uh, we have the consensus document. So different publications don't yet converge towards a consensus, let's say. So here are the me main points of consensus. So it's difficult to summarize this in just a few minutes. Uh, you know, the work uh, took several months to complete uh, for the people working on the project. 
So I'll, I've tried to make uh, this as legible as possible. So with respect to the impact of methanization on the quality of water, this is a complex uh, subject. Uh, uh, complexity is what we're hearing in this conference. So it's very dependent on context. We're talking about pedoclimatic context. In other words, each area, each zone. So the, the, this word pedoclimatic context is used in agriculture. It, it, it talks about the type of soil, the type of uh, climate, we can't talk about impacts without taking into account this notion of pedoclimatic context, but also practices when you're fertilizing, when you're coordinating uh, the use of digested uh, with the different kinds of crop rotations. So it's something that requires more work. We need to have more in-depth work carried out because we haven't uh, got to the end of, of matters yet. And uh, so we have a certain points of consensus. I'll list them. I've been working on it for several months now, so it, it seems obvious to me. But, uh, you know, they, this, this work did require a lot of discussion, a lot of additional uh, discussion. So the practice of spreading is essential. So it's similar spreading with uh, a, a, an equivalent quantity of nitrogen does have the risk of uh, leaching that goes with it because there's and that means that there's a transfer in the water compartment. That's something that we want to limit. So the digestate does present this risk that is similar of, of leaching. So uh, organic waste products uh, are, are fairly well known. So liquid manure, solid manure, compost, all of these families of organic waste. Uh, so th these are the residue of the transformation process. So this family, which is used uh, greatly in agriculture, and it's been done in an, uh, an empirical manner for centuries. So digestive is a new uh, member of that same family. But, you know, it, it has the same kind of risks as the other families. Why? Well, because the risks of leaching are above all influenced by agricultural practices. So when we talk about farming practices, we talk about spreading techniques, but also doses, contributions, when you add uh, uh, the products that are spread the first uh, in the first uh, conference we didn't talk about just m one type of methanization we talked about methanizations and it, it's the same here there are families of digestates that are fairly uh, diverse and they go they go back into the soil and that's what the challenge is so it's difficult to talk about just one kind of digestate then the methanization unit so the introduction of a methanization unit is quite likely to modify spreading practices in the zone concerned. So we're talking about effects uh, that extend beyond those of the change of product. You know, you're talking about changing equipment, organization, logistics, etc. And here again, uh, there's another point of consensus, and that is that covering soil in winter does help to limit uh, nitrogen leaching with methanization, but also for other reasons, in, in particular in sensitive areas from the point of view of water quality, so linked to the nitrate directed, especially in, in uh, catchment areas. So covering soil in the winter, uh, this is something that's been done for several years, and, and we know that it works, it helps to limit uh, the leaching of nitrogen. So the digestate um, can be used for uh, soil coverage because methanization encourages the introduction of um, intermediary energy crops. Uh, and so it's possible to diversify crop rotations in farms. So as I was saying, yes, the, the introduction of these intermediary energy crops do offer an advantage. So it's a, it's a source of improving uh, impacts on the quality of water. So there we are. Hopefully, I 
it, it wasn't uh, too difficult to follow. Very quickly, I tried to present to you the points of the uh, consensus. Now let's talk about the debate, the, the debates and the need for uh, further work. So there are different points that do not uh, attract a consensus. In other words, these are points that need additional work. So the main points, the main points, there are challenges. Well, we were talking about the quality of water and we were talking about nitrates, but of course there are others today. We don't have enough documentation, but, you know, digested spreading together with the introduction of intermediary crops, does that allow us to decrease the um, a, a polluting of agricultural plots? There are also questions about uh, methani methanation and uh, the volume of entrance of input. Sorry. So, you know, how does uh, the nitrogen balance change? Because in areas where often we often don't have any breeding, so there are no fertilization practices. The practices are fairly based on the use of minerals. And when you introduce an organic uh, product, for example, digest it, then you have the uh, question of nitrogen that comes up. And another question concerns uh, these uh, intermediary energy crops to limit uh, leaching of, of nitrogen between crops. So some of these points are being looked into further. So here I've cited a, a certain number of scientific work. So there's the thesis at the INRE in Toulouse and GRDF. So there the idea is to look at these intermediary crops, uh, water, nitrogen, and carbon will also be studied in the coming years as part of that thesis. And then there's a new program that's uh, starting in 2022. It's called Metetrage for the third generation of meta, uh, methanization methanization. The idea is to look at innov innovative agri-methanization systems that help us with the energy transition and the challenges of agroecology. So it's a more overall study that takes into uh, account these different aspects. So it's difficult to dis differentiate between the two if we want to have a, an idea of the different impacts. And to finish, uh, we've talked uh, a lot about the indirect and direct effects of digested on the quality of water, but there are also questions about the induced effect. In other words, how, because we're, we're, we're changing scale, aren't we? We're moving on to a macro scale, a, a, a regional scale. So if we have more methanization, how will that impact on uh, crop rotation or uh, what's happening in meadows, would this be uh, damaging for the quality of water? So these induced effects, these induced effects, um, they haven't been studied, we don't have the, the figures. We've got uh, warnings, there are alerts, but there are no studies on this uh, on this subject. So work needs to be carried out in the future. Sorry, Grégory, just give me one more minute, please. So we're talking about the state of scientific knowledge, but it's important to know that uh, using the best practices means that, uh, you know, we're reducing the risk of uh, negative effects. And that's why AgroPolitech is drafting a guide about the, the right use of digested. And this will be published soon as technical data sheets that can be used uh, by those uh, using digested. So it has this it has an important role to play when it comes to water quality. Thank you very much for your attention. And I will, of course, be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Armel. So just as uh, Francois uh, talked about uh, greenhouse gas uh, effects, I'm going to ask him to open the microphone. If you can just put a stop to the presentation, I suppose that uh, any agricultural resource uh, is precious, just like water. 
So this is something that you look at on a day-to-day -day basis, but as a farmer and a methanizer, how do you see things? Well, this has an important impact on the fertilization and, and quality of water. Can't really say you now, but uh, this did have an impact on fertilization. Before, in the past, we had a solid and liquid manure with different agronomic uh, agronomic uh, values. We use them to their best. Today, we have a digested, digested that's uh, very uniform in the tanks, and we know the values of the digested because we carry out analyses several times a year. Uh, so there's the uh, SMO that goes up as well because I've reduced uh, my purchasing of chemical fertilizers by 60%. So the, there is the wheat that's used in the digested. And, and according to what we want to achieve in terms of amendment uh, with the phase separation, we can use solid digesters for uh, our purposes uh, or a liquid digester for uh, subliminal fertilization. So we basically take the nitrogen where the plants need it. So we've already got mineralization, so it's now directly uh, available for the plants. So I think this does help. It does help to maintain the quality of water. Yes, it's part of uh, best practices for the profession, as Armel was saying in her conclusion. Thank you very much, Francois. So um, we'll see you later after Romain Giraud's presentation who is uh, an assistant to uh, the director at OPAL, which is part of the INRE uh, Agronomic Engineering Institute. Please uh, start your presentation. You're going to be talking about air quality and uh, spreading as well. Can you hear me? Perfect. So hello, everybody. So my name is Romain Giraud. We're going to move away from the CSF work because the, what was asked by the organizers was to give a presentation on methanization and quality of air, and in particular to focus on one of the components of methanation, methanization linked to uh, ammonia emissions. So I'm going to go through a number of points and say how we can minimize uh, emissions of ammonia. Uh, this is a slightly different presentation from the previous presentations because we're talking about an external factor that can be potentially negative if we try, don't try and mitigate it, the emissions. So that's the objective, to mitigate the emissions so that the impact of methanization is, is neutral, if not positive. So just a quick presentation. I wanted to tell you where the main risks of uh, nitrogen uh, leaks were. So here we've got a typical kind of methanation system with phase separation, with storage, uh, spreading, return to soil. So we've got raw digested. We're looking mainly at phase, uh, liquid phase. So there are different figures that we can find in terms of risk, the risk of, of, of loss. So uh, this is where we don't uh, control things very well. The challenges mainly focus on spreading and uh, the use of raw digested. So we're looking at half of the uh, total nitrogen in the digested and often in the storage of liquid digested, where you can lose up to 25%. So we're talking about risk and the challenge of the presentation is to present you how we can minimize these risks and uh, bring the, the figures down. So already, you know, you can say, what about the environmental challenges with respect to how we control ammonia emissions? This is the first uh, risk. Uh, uh, so you can have 30% for nitrogen leaching, that's a maximum. But what about ammonia? There are also uh, environmental and public health uh, challenges. So ammonia emissions into the atmosphere uh, create uh, atmospheric effects, so uh, acidifying soil and eutrophicating certain environments, especially aquatic environments. There's also the health aspect and, and uh, occupational health uh, and d disturbance. 
because there's a potential toxicity. So it's better to confine the environment. This is important for those working in methanize, methanization, you know, if they're working with digesters. And then thirdly, uh, there's the environmental, another environmental aspect. Ammonia is a precursor of fine particles. It combines with um, nitrogen oxides to create particles that are very fine. And this is uh, important when you take into account urban transport. And the combination of these elements means that we've got ammonium that may contribute to specific springtime pollution episodes. So just a slide to explain to you how it works, how different uh, minimization methods may work. So for ammonia, in a liquid environment, a digested or some kind of solution, some kind of liquid environment, you've got NH4, the acid form, and then, and then the alkaline form, which is NH3, uh, it's dissolved, but it can be potentially volatile. So we need to have a balance between these two forms. And this is going to depend on the pH. The pK is 9.2. So we've got to have this balance because this is a potentially volatile form and it can be transformed into a, a gas and the quantity of nitrogen is transferred and it will depend on the uh, compression that you have at the surface. So why, why is there specific uh, sensitivity here? Well, because the pH is often high with a concentration of nitrogen, which is quite high. And often in some cases, we replace mineral fertilizers, uh, which where uh, the ammonia is controlled by organized organic fertilization and that can be uh, sensitive to this kind of emission. So I've been through the two main aspects of, of this system. So how can we now minimize these emissions uh, and, and move to five instead of 25 or 50 percent? Well, there are different possibilities. The first solution is to reduce the exchange surface between the digested and the air. So we know that a lagoon with respect to a ditch have a surface exchange rate uh, that is different. So the, so the solution, so when, it, when we talk about covering ditches, there are two types of covers. There's a natural cover. So if you grow uh, um, crusts on the ditch, you can reduce emissions by 30 to 40 percent. But the, this doesn't always work. It works for raw digested rather than li the liquid digested. So, or uh, fiber digested rather than non-fiber fibrous digested. And it's not really adapted to frequent spreading because uh, you've, you've got to have your, your crust that has to remain. And the second kind of cover is an artificial cover, which is flexible or, or rigid, where you've got a 60 to 80% coverage according to the type of cover. So what about uh, the spreading side of the story? We've talked about storage and volatilization. So this diagram represents what happens when you spread muck in brown? We've got the, the different uh, digestants, and you've got to have the balance between the uh, different volatile forms, and the, you've got to control the volatilization phenomenon. So once you've spread, the, nothing happens. And that's because there's no more contact between the atmospheric air and the digested, because it's uh, infiltrated or there's not enough NH4 available. So there are two strategies that can be used to limit the emission of ammonia. First of all, you can accelerate infiltration of the product, so more contact between digesters and air, and uh, decrease uh, the speed of volatilization so that there's time to do something and, and to bury the digested uh, further into the soil. So it's these two strategies that can be combined. So let's start with this uh, first, accelerate infiltration of the digester that's been spread. So one of the determining criteria is the type of spreading device that's used. So there are different, uh, you can have to 30 to 60% uh, reduction in emissions uh, with the middle uh, 
photo and then uh, you've got the possibility of using a nozzle flapper as well but there are also other things that can contribute to the acceleration of infiltration you can uh, work the the soil uh, to bury the digested so just after it's been spread two-thirds of ammonia emissions happen so it's usually you know in the first few hours after the, uh, the digestate has been spread so the infiltration of the project is something that we often don't talk about so if you've got soil that's not too, not too too um uh, compact uh, it will work but the other possibility is to decrease the content of uh, suspended uh, material in the digesters this uh, will have a a, a lower viscosity that will limit the contact between the digestate and the air and bring down ammonia emissions. For the first two, we're talking about things that are primordial, but for this last driver, it's something that's more marginal, let's say. The second objective is to decrease the volatilization speed by uh, allowing the digestate to uh, filter down into the soil or allowing the farmer to do something about this. So there are different things that have to be taken into account. Temperature, the lower the temperature, the, the lower the volatilization speed. So as of 15 degrees, that's, uh, you know, it's better to do it in the morning or at night, for example. It's important to have the right kind of uh, a sun, shine or humidity, not too dry, not too much sun. That's ideal if you want to limit emissions. You've got to think about uh, this third point. And then the next idea is to limit the, the surface that where you spread the digested, because the bigger the exchange surface, the faster the um, volatilization so it's it's also important to not use the nozzle flapper where possible and then there's another option that's to use leaves it's an option that exists for people uh, who do their spreading uh, using the, the corn that has grown and this also limits exchange it limits the dilution of the ammonia that's emitted into the atmosphere it, it, it limits the concentration gradient and, and lowers the speed of volatilization. So a summary of what I've just said now. So it's important to have different technical solutions, uh, coverage, uh, for example, is important, but you also have to know when to spread, what to use to spread, uh, when is the best season to do this. But another thing is important is not to say, okay, let's just uh, do something about uh, spreading or storage you've got to combine different ac different actions however and this is something that can be seen the good news is that what we're seeing and what we've uh, heard already is that if we do everything well if we introduce all of these measures that allow us to limit uh, these the emission of ammonia is either equivalent or better than before you know if the right kind of drivers are used so you know it's not something that you have to just be uh, subjected to but there are different factors that have to be taken into account many different factors even if you do everything really well there are still unexpected events that will reduce uh, the effect of, of efforts so you know there is a certain amount of uncertainty with respect to the results so I've just talked to you about ammonia because that's what you asked me, but I'd just like to focus quickly on the other things that we have to be careful about. So, uh, so um, when we're talking about ammonia and air quality, these things are also important. So first of all, uh, emissions of smells, especially close to sites. So you can have emissions from the storage of certain substrates. And also another thing to look out for are emissions from biogas uh, systems. This can have uh, an impact on the quality of air. You know, you can have combustion that generates emissions, and that's another thing to look at. And the last point to look at 
accidental emissions, for example, valves that blow, uh, you know, you can have things uh, happening that uh, are unexpected. Thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions after the session. Uh, we have plenty of questions. Thank you very much, Romain, for this presentation, a very clear presentation. So I conclude that everything is in the hands of the farmers concerning the practices, concerning the max spreading windows. François, do you have a reaction to this? Well, basically, personally speaking, in the AMF, we work a great deal with um, INRE, the organization. Yes, you work, you work with the different regional organizations. So we've worked a great deal on nitrogen losses. It's true that if, for example, we replace um, fertilizer with digestate, then obviously the nit nitrogen that we spread, has to, we have to control it. We don't want to be losing uh, nitrogen and ammonia into the atmosphere. So on my farm, and this has been the case right from the outset, we use what we call a disc uh, barrier. We bury below the surface, we bury the digestate below the surface, about 10 to 15 centimeters below the surface. So this reduces the nitrogen uh, emissions. There's, there's, there's no problem on the surface of the soil because of this, and there's no, sm no smell, or at least the smell is very, very limited. That's what I wanted to say. Also, there's another thing that we've started to do in Brittany. We've done a certain number of tests on this. We're gradually looking to acidify the digestate, and we do this using direct incorporation of uh, sulfuric acid. And this has a specific impact. It brings the pH level down considerably and helps you avoid greenhouse effect gases. For the moment, we're testing the process um, well, it's we're slightly beyond the testing process, but they're starting to use it in a certain number of other countries. Also, when it comes to spreading the digestate, um, this is something that we're a tiny bit kind of worried about because you have, as Romain said, you've got to find the best time of the year to do it. There are certain days, for example, where it's a bit misty, so that to me is quite quite a good day for muck spreading, and particularly it's good to do it on a day when there's no there's no wind. Yes, it does complicate things slightly, but this is why we're trying to fine tune what we do in terms of the wheels and the way in which the wheels can potentially get dirty. There's always, um, you know, there's a bit of toing and froing to do until you come up with the perfect method. Thank you very much, Francois. Let me now pass the floor over to Safia, Safia Menasseri, who is a lecturer and a researcher, and she's going to focus on the last subject that we wanted to present to you today, and this concerns the quality of the soils. So over to you, Safia. If you can turn your camera on, please, and your presentation. Good morning, everybody. I hope you're all able to see my presentation. Right, so I'm going to focus on the impact of methanization on cultivated soils. I'm not going to present you with results that we received ourselves. Um, we will do this in the future, but I'm going to basically give you an idea of the state of the art based on the bibliography that I've been able to compile and based on international publications, notably from countries that have been doing methanization for a lot longer than we have in France, Denmark, Germany, Canada, um, the United States. Now, first of all, what I'd like to say is, as is always the case when we evaluate an agricultural practice, and notably when we look at organic products, when we look at the quality of the soil, we always show um, pay attention to the organic matters in the soils. When we talk about the quality of the soil, when we talk about what the soils need to do, in other words, enable plants to grow and a certain number of environmental aspects, well, the soils have to be living elements. Uh, there has to be a lot of water that is able to circulate correctly in the soil. There has to be a certain amount of dampness, humidity, but not too much. And the soil needs, needs to be easy to dig as such. So you've got the intrinsic qualities of the soils. There's the question of the smell as well. There are a certain number of properties that we cannot take action on. At the opposite end of the scale, the organic matters of the soils that play a role, play an important role 
when it comes to the way in which the soil functions, well, it's an it's an an aspect as we've seen we've and we've talked about it. Um, there are certain organic matters that we can alter, that we can change, and these organic matters are essential when it comes to increasing the diversity and the activity of the microorganisms, and it's something that also enables the soil to uh, serve a certain number of environmental functions, such as the regulation of the air quality and the quality of the water in the soil. So what impact does methanization have on this component, in other words, the organic Organic matter that is contained within the soils. Now, how do we actually go about studying this subject? Well, rather as with water quality and in relation to what has already been said, we show an interest, first of all, in the quality of the digestate as, the, as a product. We look at its fertilizing value or capacity. It all depends on the amounts of digestate that are going to be injected into the soil and the quality of the digestate will enable us to see um, and we take into account for this the temperature, the entrance, and so on and so forth. And the quality of the digestate will have an impact on what happens when it's fed back into the soil. Based on the literature that we've studied, there are many different processes, many different entrants, and the results, it's very hard to obtain results at the current time based on the data that we have. What I also wanted to mention is that when we say that there is an impact, that methanization has a positive or negative impact or no impact at all, via the digestate well basically we need to first of all look at what we're comparing digestate with are we comparing it for example with um, a product that doesn't contain any chemical substances or are we comparing with other organic substances and they can be very varied or are we comparing the digestate with the initial non-digested product it, it can be a case of manure that hasn't been digested for example all of this necessarily will have an impact on the type of results that we obtain and we need to take into account the different types of soil that are going to receive the digestate as Armel said also there's another dimension that is very important this concerns all of the changes that, that take place in a farm and the different types of crops that are grown and then you need to work out exactly when the methanization is introduced, how the muck spreading takes place, what the practice practices, what are the management methods. And basically, as a result, there are very few studies that look at the impact of methanization on the soil at this level, taking all these aspects into account. I'm referring to the digestate, not because it's what is most important, but because this is what I can talk about, because most of the publications out there tend to give results at this level in relation to digestate specifically. So when we talk about recycling or valorizing digestate, we're talking about the fertilizing capacity. And we tend to talk about two components, the fertilizer capacity that is related to the nitrogen availability that is contained within the organic product for short term plant growing, compared with a more long term value, the amendment value. And here we show an interest in the carbon contained within the organic products. And notably, we look at the stable format of this carbon and how it contrib contributes on a long-term basis to the soil and how this carbon that is imported into the soil is going to contribute to more carbon storage in the soil, but also to an improvement in, the certain, in a certain number of properties, for example, such as the porousness of the soil and its capacity to stop water and so on and so, so forth. So there are a wide variety of products, as you can see, that are used in farming. Some of them are um, products that are biodegradable. You have different types of compost, for example. And then you have the digestates that are considered as being intermediate products. And if we perform a phase separation, we'll have a liquid phase that will tend to be a fertilizer and a solid phase will tend to behave more like an amendment. Um, sometimes we realize that during the liquid phase, some of the types of carbon that are present uh, are a very, very stable carbon phases. Once again, as Armel said, there's a massive range of digestates. Here you've got a summary that I took from a bibliographic review by a Canadian author. Um, this is based on international literature that demonstrates that there are all different types of digestate with varying amounts of dry or solid matter in them. Some digestates can contain a great deal of nitrogen, nitrogen, ammonia-based nitrogen, 
and when we start looking at the percent percentages of dry matter, we have similar results for other organic matters. Um, it can be as high as 25. Next, the phosphorus content varies. What I've underscored here is the nitrogen over phosphorus relationship. This is mentioned in one of the publications as being seven for a digestate and 3.5 for non-digested uh, manure. So even when you've got digestate, that contains um, manure, the uh, amount of nitrogen will be lower. Another point that's very interesting, this is in, re in relation to the amend amendment of the digestate. As you can see, look at the line of cellulite that varies between 0.22 and 1.71, and you get a value of 0.5. This is the value beyond which we consider that the product is stable, and when it's an amendment, so here you can also see the different types of behavior according to the project. When it comes to the damp contribution or the humidity contribution of the digestates, here the authors in fact compared um, 100 carbon units for vegetable or plant biomass. And the, the damp contribution is said to amount to approximately 14% when full. And what you basically need to keep in mind from this summary here is that with methanization, we know that we lose carbon because we produce biogas. Um, however, we know that this carbon at the end of the day stabilizes during the methanization process. So we have less carbon that is fed into the soil, but there's also a humic contribution that improves. And this means that over time, we won't have any impact from methanization on the amount of carbon that exists in the soil. Nevertheless, we need to be show a certain amount of caution because these results are based on replacing a certain amount of carbon equivalent between standard farming practices and the digestate from these residues or the digestate from manure. Um, so I repeat, I think you've just got to be a bit cautious in how you interpret these results, but nevertheless, certain results showed that the that carbon is stabilized during the methanization process. Next, when it comes to the long-term differences or, re or reductions, well, for the moment, I only found two studies that demonstrated that there is no significant difference whether you use farming residues or um, manure residues. It doesn't seem to make any difference in terms of the long term impact uh, of the methanization process on the soils. But we do know that it takes a long time to come up with significantly different results. We also have a, an FL test that is scheduled for this year. Every year, if you like, we perform a study on different types of digestate that are introduced to the soil and we will continue with this. Let me move ahead very quickly. This is simply a, a very global summary of the impact on of the soil quality. Here we've taken into account the chemical physical aspects of the soil. Globally speaking, we can see that the impact of adding digestate to the soil would seem to be very positive. One author here only said that there's no impact on the quality of the soil. I'm not going to go into detail on the reasons. Um, what I would note that a lot of other writers uh, said there were tangible results. Let, let us note that there are some temporary effects, that it's very hard to work out what the chemical impact is. Uh, that hasn't been studied very much. But concerning what has been studied, in other words, the impact on the biological, biological properties, we're very clearly uh, fertilizing the soil um, it, using digestate does improve the microbial activity of the soil. But it would seem that potentially speaking, um, despite the impact is positive, it's not as positive as the non-digested effluents. Here there are a certain number of st studies whereby they compare digested effluents compared with non-digested effluents, but from, from different farms nevertheless. So once again, the information is not necessarily conclusive. conclusive. It's several effluents in several farms and digestates in other farms 
But here, what we can see is that on the left-hand side, you've got the microbial carbon that accounts for 1.9% of the total carbon carbon in the soils that receives the digestates, compared with 2.3% for the soils that receive the non-digested breeding effluents. So there's not much of a difference. And here on the right-hand side, I can't see it properly from where I am, but it would seem that there, there are less uh, there are less fungi, less but fewer bacteria in the digestate. Here you've got the fungic and bacterial measurements, so fewer bacteria in the digestate compared with uh, manure or liquid manure that hasn't been digested, but the bacteria. Um, fungi ratio remains the same between the two types of products, um, but this needs to be checked further. What we believe with my colleague Romain Giraud is that it's not so much the microbial variety in the digestate that is going to have an impact, but the carbon from the digestate and the different types of carbon. Um, once they're fed back into the soil. Concerning the physical properties, we see a positive impact. But I did want to highlight two points to be watched over. The fact that all organic products, wherever they come from, well, you have to be careful about accumulating suspended elements that can modify the soil or monovalent um, elements being accumulated because this can create um, this can create a situation whereby the soil structure is dispersed. So concerning the impact on macro fauna, very little impact it would seem from what we've been able to see. The positive impact of the digestate here comes from the fact that it improves the dampness of the soils and hence it can make soil more favorable to um, helping plants to grow. Concerning earthworms, it would seem that there's a negative impact, but it's only temporary on, uh, on worms. This is because there's a great deal of um, ammonia initially that is contributed, but it would. But this result was obtained with very, very high doses of digestate, um, 250 kilos of digestate, which is absolutely massive. To conclude, and I'm trying to move ahead a lot more quickly, let me just stress that we're carrying out a lot of different types of research work. We're working very hard on managing a lot of PhD theses and working with students on different research programs, also with certain engineering schools and uh, associations. And we also have our own experimental site, FL. This in turn should enable us to acquire um, a lot of different results um, based on laboratory tests, based on long-term testing, and based on testing on site with the farmers, a certain number of references, um, taking into account the specific conditions of the soil, the climate, and the plants that grow on the farms. We want to fully understand the mechanisms so that we can guarantee that our results over time can be transferred to other areas. And we hope that in 2022, we'll be able to present all of these results to you. Thank you very much. Can I let you turn your presentation off? And without further ado, I'm going to pass the floor over to Francois. Francois, can you give us one last reaction before I start passing around the questions? Yes, it's very interesting to note that the life of the soil is some, something that we're very interested in because we don't want to destroy our soil because of the digestate. On the contrary, we want to improve it, improve it. So when you only look at the digestate as such over the last 10 years, I must admit, I haven't seen any negative impact due to the fact that we're incorporating digestate into the soils. And when we look at the global impact of the methanization process, and when, when we look at the different intermediate energy crops that have been planted, I believe we improve the structure of the soil thanks to the roots of these inter intermediate energy crops, because obviously they develop and they grow very quickly. Having said that, we are very watchful, we're very cautious, because it's important to take samples um, in year one before you plant anything to see how the soil then evolves due to the methanization process. And as Safia said, within our organization, we've set up a certain number of studies that we're performing with students. They come to the farms and they go to neighboring farms. We have a total of four schools in France that we're working with. And globally speaking, it would seem that when it comes to worms, we 
we haven't seen any negative impact in terms of the presence of the worms. In Nancy, for example, there were more worms that appeared. Nancy was one of the four schools. Okay, so what you're saying is there is work in progress in the field and there, there will be results in the future, hopefully, potentially, uh, with a report that will be disseminated more broadly. Can I just add one piece of information? Because I saw this when I was listening to my colleague Philippe from Oatmount, who's produced a certain number of videos of his soil, and he showed the, the, the microbes and the bacteria in his soil even after the spreading of the digestate. It is possible to see that there's still life in the soil, a lot of life in the soil. So people have a lot of preconceived ideas when they imagine that once you add the digestate, the soil doesn't live in brackets as it does normally. Well, we as farmers, we have certainties. We, we're sure that we're working well, but nevertheless, we think it's important to measure and check that what we're doing is the right thing. We have researchers who come and work with us to check whether the soil has changed from a positive or negative uh, perspective due to methanization. Let me make the most of this opportunity before I pass the floor over to the participants with their questions. Um, I'd just like to pass on the last comment from Alice Lustis from CTBM. She has said that there's a site where you've got a whole list of many different types of information, notably on the impacts, and the site is infometer.org with different sources from scientific publications and uh, studies that are explained in detail. So do feel free to use and overuse this kind of source because they are very, very detailed. Thank you, Francois, for your testimonial. Can you please all turn your cameras back on so that we can see you and so that we can talk through the different questions? Question number one. Cécile, when you gave your introduction, uh, a first question arrived concerning externalities. Why didn't you take into account the externalities related to savings on the electrical storage systems? Ah, that's a very interesting question. On positive externalities today, we've basically focused on those externalities that come from methanization, injectable methanization, notably. And this is why we tend to work on the gas network and on the impact of methanization via the production of biogas. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for this answer. Next, Pascal Garçon from GRDF, if I'm right. Thank you to you. And can you tell us what about the interministerial assignment that was launched at the end of 2020 for the monetization of externalities? Well, this um, this is something that gave uh, that paved the way forward for a certain amount of work on the subject. We also have worked on the subject and we've presented the progress that we've made. It would seem, based on the information that I've got, that the report is now complete, but they haven't yet published the report. And I don't have any date for the publication of these results. Okay, so we're looking forward to seeing this report. Absolutely. Thank you, Cecile. Silva, many, many questions concerning greenhouse effect gases. I can't put all the questions to you, but you'll find them in the chat and I do invite you to answer the questions I won't have conveyed to you. Um, I will with pleasure. Philippe Viltar is asking, for example, whether the calculation tool will be recognized and used within the scope of the certification schemas, the IFCC certification schemas. No, absolutely not. This is um, a method that we wanted to implement. These Excel files, it's something that we wanted to design. Okay, we will approve them within the scope of the low carbon label, but not necessarily from an international perspective. There's another methodology, another form of calculator that can also be used, but the problem is it doesn't necessarily always take into account all the functionalities, nor all of the benefits of meth methanization. So that's why we redid the method. Okay, in terms of what you're saying, this leads me on to the next question. Why did you not use the bio, Biogress 2 tool? Well, because it doesn't take into account certain scenarios. It doesn't take into account inter intermediate crops. To be honest, it's just it's not tailored to the French context and um, intermediate crops. 
to use but one example. They're things that are very specific. So that's why we wanted a good tool that was appropriate for what happens in France. What happens in France doesn't necessarily go on in other countries and vice versa. OK, I've got another question as well. What, to what extent do you take into account the impact of greenhouse effect gases per project? For example, um, the quality of the torpaulin that you put on the digesters, etc. Hmm. We did take into account all of the uh, waste treatment uh, approaches because that can have an impact on the type of methane. But when it comes to the water tightness, to the torpaulins, etc., no, I don't think there's that much difference in terms of the water tightness. At least I hope there isn't. We didn't different. We did. We're not aware that there are any major differences. We didn't really focus on this. I hope that the water tightness is guaranteed. Although over time, of course, um, that can change slightly. But also, this leads me to another question that I've seen. The question was, in terms of the LCAs, the life cycle analysis, is everything taken into account? Yes, we took into account the upstream, the downstream, and the building. Um, and the basic idea was to take into account absolutely all of the sector. In other words, everything that contributes to the, to the end product. One last question, and then I'll let you answer the others directly in the chat if you don't mind, so that we're not frustrating any of our numerous participants, because we had about 200 participants here. What regulatory coexistence exists between the low carbon label and the current uh, guarantee of origin approaches? Well, this is something that is currently under discussion. Um, for the moment, we haven't yet made a decision one way or the other. Um, we might go for the guaranteed origin products when it comes to greenhouse effect gases, but maybe the two will continue to go hand in hand. I repeat, we are taking both of them into account, both these issues into account, but we haven't yet made a decision. Thank you, Sylvain. Armel. We have a question. Arnaud Jumel would like to know, within the scope of the working group that you're in charge of, you worked hand in hand with different actors who work on hydrothermal gasification or other processes to examine the feasibility and who could provide a solution for cleaning up the digestates with a more uh, prospective approach is a question actually have you done that well i know that we didn't focus on this specific question i think that the framework or the scope of the work that I was interested with was a scope whereby we stipulated, well, what are the conditions um, in which we can return the digestic to the soil and guarantee that it's an advantage in terms of the quality of the water. So we're looking at optimizing the value of the soil via the adding of the digestate. So the question was, can all of the digestates produced by the methan methanization sector be re-injected into the soil? Maybe some alternatives could be studied, but this wasn't, um, this wasn't the question that we were asked to focus on within our working group. Thank you. Yes, clearly you need um, a very granular approach to all of these issues. Romain, we have a, another question, notably, we have a question from a person who works for the Dreal in the Rhône-Alpes region, who is saying, what about the impact on the quality of the air because of the um, ammonia? Could, could there not be aspects that could fly into the air and pollute the air? Hmm. Well, when it comes to uh, nitrogen protoxide, I think he said. It's very interesting. Um, when it comes to our methanization processes, in terms of emissions, what we focus on is the return to the soil and to a lesser extent, the storage or the composting of the digestate. The main part that we work upon is the return to the soil, and the process is so complex that for the moment we find it very difficult to see what the specific 
impact of each phase of the methanization is. Obviously, what has an impact on the N2O is the pedoclimatic aspects, and we don't really have any data at the moment that enables us to say what the impact is, positive, negative, or neutral. Okay, thank you very much, Romain. I've got another question on the muck spreading techniques. Uh, Alexandre Geoffrin would like to put this question to us from the Chamber of Agriculture. He is asking or telling us, you haven't talked about pipe spreading. Do you use it? You could use the same system as for um, spreading, as for irrigation. It could reduce logistics and transport costs for digestate. And would it not be more effective, for example, for smells and odors? Well, I'm not sure if I understood what you mean by uh, hose. Uh, uh, muck spreading. What counts really, what's important to limit emissions is not the transport side of things, you know, how many tons, of what's going. It's, it's the uh, dispersion system used, the spreading system used. So if you have a conventional system or a system with a specific uh, uh, spreader, well, the re potential reduction is fairly similar. What's uh, What counts really is, is the spreading system. So you can have gains in terms of transport of the, of the material, yes. Yes, there you can make gains in terms of uh, logistics, in terms of compacting the earth. Uh, there's going to be uh, an indirect effect. Uh, you know, the tonnage transport can happen earlier. In other words, earlier in the season, in uh, climate conditions that are um, less uh, favorable for emissions. That's a possibility. Thank you. Perhaps uh, you could have a look at all of the questions like the others and uh, offer some answers along with the answer that you've just given us. Safia, I have uh, a question from Arnaud Lévy. He's asking whether the tables and the mixture of inputs with hydrogen and return to the soil exist. Are they very specific, these tables? Uh, well, I don't know, perhaps. Uh, no, what, what tables that tell you, that give you the recipe, the, me the recipe that you put in the methanization system? Is, is that what it is? Yes, I think that's what the question is about, you know, tables of inputs per type of input, per, per type of input mix uh, with prediction ratios for hydrogen and return to the soil, you know, uh, the, the quality of, of the amendment. I don't think there are any tables for hydrogen production, I really don't know, but in terms of the quality of the digested, well, this is really what we're trying to look into. We've got the, the doctoral thesis on the subject. We're trying to do some research. We're trying to look at the situation, look at the characteristics of the digesters according to what goes into the methanizer. Because once again, no, we don't have this information. It doesn't really, it's not available. It's up to us to, to look into all of these uh, things. And in scientific publications, when there are results, sometimes we just have information that says it's, it's a, a digested manure. You know, we find it difficult to associate a result or the quality of the digested with the process with what we have upstream today, it's not um, detailed enough. I would say, you know, it doesn't really exist. Maybe maybe I, I'm getting this wrong. I can add if something to that, if you like. So I agree, uh, we don't have that information available, but there is work uh, on the subject. There's a program called Conceptige, where the idea is to develop a tool. I can't really tell you about the hydrogen production side of things, but the idea was to have a digital tool that tells you, okay, if I've got so much percentage of liquid manure uh, and so much percent of other things, this is the kind of digest that, that I'm going to have. So a kind of a prediction tool that tells you what kind of digest that you can expect uh, depending on the substrate used. However, it's something that's still being validated. 
So it's not really a commercial tool yet. And it gives information about uh, availability of nitrogen, but not, not so much for the other inputs. Yes, really, it's just uh, focused on uh, basic characteristics. No, it doesn't tell us about any services provided by the digester to fertilization service. So it's a program, Fertilige. So thank you, Adeline and uh, the others for helping to provide links to projects uh, that deal with these subjects. You will probably be able to pick up some information there. So keep in mind that many of you asked about this. All of the presentations and the replay will be available after the conference. It's the same for all of the presentations, the Bio360 week presentations, they'll be available on the online uh, site. Concerning work on greenhouse gases and water quality carried out as part of the uh, Strategic Sector Committee coordinated by Françoise, uh, focusing on external factors and, and Frédéric, you'll find the deliver deliverables on uh, a site, I'm sorry, the interpreter didn't catch the address of the site. One last question for Francois. So, we're ask, we're, Francois, you talked about whether uh, we have any crop damage with the use of, of various things. Well, I use a, a specific uh, spreader, so it's 24 meters, so it means that you don't have to go over the area different times. Others use uh, burying equipment that use well, so with discs, uh, I think he said three centimeters wide, but it's better to have a 100 ton spreader. Um, because that reduces how many times you have to go over the area. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, specification. Now, there are many questions. I can't ask all of you because we've already run out of time. But it was very exciting, very complete, very comprehensive. Thank you to all of you. Thank you to the organizers for making it possible to uh, go through this subject, uh, and we had all we had over 220 participants, I believe. Thank you to all of you. There are two things that I need to say. At two o'clock, there will be a conference where you'll be able to see Frédéric G from GRDF, he, acting as co-pilot for the industrialization and competitiveness uh, of the sector. And this conference is called Optimizing Production Costs, uh, Drivers of Methanization that are profitable today and tomorrow. So we're looking at uh, dropping costs by 30%. We're talking about OPEX and CAPEX. So Sylvain and the other speakers will be talking about that at two o'clock. And at four o'clock, there's another conference moderated by Armel Damiano on the professionalization of the sector. What feedback is there? What kind of improvement process are we talking about? So a very full afternoon. Thank you for your participation and uh, please enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Merci, au revoir.